Um, sorry, is set up for uh, Rex is coming back, and I'm going. What are you doing? Um, set up for propers. So a lot of the information <clears throat> is directed that way, um, but it can also be helpful for other LDAs, paralegals who also need to do accountings and things of that nature. So again, keep in mind the class is pretty basic. Um, so it doesn't really go into, when you get into the accounting part, different scenarios. Um, in fact, I really wish any of my accountings nowadays were um, this basic, but they tend to get very complicated, but we're going to go through and how we will start um, the material is I will start off with the inventory and appraisal because that's the first thing that's needed when um, you complete an accounting. Then Rex will go through the accounting portion and then I will jump back on to do the um, petition for the approval of the accounting and things like that. I'm gonna somewhat make it interactive um, typically do that just so I make sure y'all are awake or even listening to me. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but um, you all are a lot further in this than typical class participants because like I said, they are preparers who really have never had any experience, never seen any of these forms, have, don't even know the first step of completing them. Um, the forms, in, uh, this is the class workshop. This will give all the dates we are giving this class. You can um, sign up for this class as many times as you want. We need the next one. Um, it's what? We need the next one. This says June. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Carrie's already put out. You just didn't upload that? I, no, I didn't see it. Yet. Um, there is a new, sorry about that. This it only goes to this class. There is a new workshop um, dates um, for the remainder of the year. And I think January, um, it includes January of next year. So again, you can take the class as many times as you want. Although keep in mind, the class really repeats. Um, each class really does not give a whole lot more um, information. And in fact, maybe only one or two little things change. Um, but sometimes, especially if you do get pro pers on um, as class participants, it's interesting to be able to hear their questions or um whether they ask me to slow down or they get it or they'll speak their different scenarios they're experiencing and maybe what they need help with. So again, you're free to attend as many classes as you wish um, regarding the accounting workshop. Only thing you need to do is sign up with the Contra Costa County Public Law Library. Information is below down here. And they provide us a list of participants. They like to know um, who is attending, how many people are attending, and um, stuff like that. So it will always continue to have the sign-up sheet through them. Um, and... Again, if you have any um, questions, because we really don't have any pro pers on here, you truly can ask, um, but I'm gonna slide right through here pretty quick because there's a whole lot of material. Um, please also understand, especially if you're an LDA, you may complete, for instance, the inventory and appraisal a little bit different than I'm going to teach. Um, again, keep in mind, this class was set up for a 
for pro pers, so they don't have the experience that an LDA does um, to change or do like the inventory and appraisal a little different. So again, this is just set up to train pro pers and if you do things a little bit different by all means continue doing it the way you do it um so we'll go through that and again if anybody has any questions please feel free i myself during the training if you put any questions up in the chat likely won't see them because i'm looking forward on the screen where the chat is to my right side so if i do miss you speak up stop me whatever um or something like that just to get my attention so is everybody ready you got your coffee your donuts and everybody ready to get started all right you're gonna be a quiet bunch today i see but that's okay. Okay, so I'm going to start with um, the inventory and appraisal. Typically, I do tell the pro pers to ignore my sample. Again, the sample came from the Contra Costa County um, Law Library. So um, it is already completed, already filled out. Um, and I typically change what I say because I tell a pro per that the data up here that we have in the sample is if an attorney prepared this, but if they were preparing the inventory and the appraisal by themselves, they would include their information and not necessarily, they wouldn't include an attorney. So, Completing the top half uh, part of the inventory and appraisal includes the name and address of either the proper, the law firm, the attorney, what have you. Phone numbers, also you all know, list phone number, fax is optional. Email address, um, that is also optional, but it typically is how the court will respond to you sometimes. Attorney four down here, this would include the name of the um, proper typically, but in this case, it's going to be a conservatorship. You would indicate court address. You all know this part. Estate of, we have Jeannie Allowry. She is a conservatee in our example. But again, you would still use this form if you have a decedent and you're doing a probate or you have a guardianship and you have a minor. Many different ways people use this inventory and appraisal. Some people will have partials, so they'll include their cash assets um on a partial they'll may do a second one for um, non-cash assets i myself typically don't do that i will typically mark just as a final you also have the box if you need to do a corrected one so i.e somebody told you or maybe um you thought the common mistake, let's just say, when doing an inventory and appraisal, and we'll get um, through that when we start over here on this date of appointment. Sometimes when this is being completed, for instance, um, let's say, let's just use this date right here. March 8th was the appointment, and um, you get a bank statement as a pro per, you get a bank statement and it starts on March 1st. If you record that as your beginning balances, it's going to completely throw off what you're trying to do. So um, you may have to do a corrected. The one for reappraisal for sale, keep in mind um, how this is used is if there is a 
let's say for a probate, you have limited authority and the decedent died in 2012. Well, nobody's touched the estate until now or tried to administer the estate till now. So say for instance, there you have a sale of a property, which we do list in this example, and you're selling the property now in 2023, your original appraisal by the probate referee will be valued on date of death. So if you have limited authority, which means you need to seek court confirmation for this a sale of property, you need to have an appraisal within one year. So you will complete this and mark it as a reappraisal as the probate referee to reappraise the value um, as of whatever date he completes it because you have a sale of property. And this also allows um, when you're taking a sale in front of a probate judge, it allows them to understand what the value is of the property. So if you're submitting a sale, you are able to, um, the judge will be able to see your sale is a good valid proper sale. And um, for instance, if the probate referee values, like let's say 900,000, you come in with a buyer who wants to offer six, of course a judge, likely would not take that offer unless you have a good explanation of why the value is so low. Then there's supplemental and there's also the property tax certificate. So you're going to be marking one of these six boxes. Case number, date of death, or appointment of a guardian or conservator. So this actual date it is confused many times. So I'm going to ask for those here, maybe somewhat of the, I don't know who's less experienced or experienced. When, say for instance, you apply, we're going to use a conservative because typically there's two different routes with a conservative fatigue, sometimes not. Sometimes you'll get a temporary, sometimes you'll get, um, go straight to a permanent. So this date right here, I want somebody to volunteer and answer. This date right here is going to be what date? I know it gives you a sample of the date, but I really want to know, is this going to be the date that the order is signed or an order is granted? Is it going to be a date that letters are issued? Because you know, sometimes you have a court date, let's say Tuesday, and the judge may say he wants a bond even. So say the judge says he wants a bond. You're scurrying around um, trying to get a bond application, get them to complete it. You know, on a bond, you need original signature when signing, stuff like that. Then it goes to the bond company. And some counties, um, especially like, uh, let's say down south, because I have a bunch of attorneys I'm a paralegal for down south. And um, let's use Los Angeles Stanley Mosk uh, courtroom. Now, it used to be that the bond company could submit or fi and file the bond um, and also take with him or her the letters that are signed. And when he turned in, he or she turned in the bond, the file clerk would automatically stamp the letters um, as filed. And if you want a certified copy, you would just pay for that copy. But nowadays or recently, and I'll say, I don't even know what time period, but recently it has been that the bonding company goes smits their bond, but it requires still a, an electronic filing of the letters. And then 
whenever the court gets around to reviewing those letters, they will stamp it and then you have to call or email a different department records and get a certified copy of it. But I'm trying to ask the question. So this date right here, is it going to be the date of the order? The date, um, or it could be date of temporary um, um, letters, or it could be date of permanent letters. What date exactly are you going to put in this box right here? We typically use the date that the letters that the, the the judge issued the letters, not the date of the letters, but the date the judge like at the the date of the hearing. Okay, sorry, hun, and I can't tell who's speaking. Oh, this is Danielle. Hi, Danielle. <laughs> Hi, hun. Okay, anybody else want to either agree or disagree with that date? Oh boy, none of y'all, either y'all are sleepy or you don't want to answer. Okay, so I will tell you this date right here is actually the date of order. Mm -hmm. The date the order judge signs the order is the date mm -hmm. you are responsible for every little penny or dime. Well, and most of the time, the reason being like you'll say, well, I kind of disagree because with an order, I cannot go to a bank and say, now I'm responsible for money, right? Um, you would also say without an order, I really can't do anything, but that's not true. So once you receive or an order is signed saying you're going to be appointed, um, you just don't have letters yet, is the time you would go in and you can start marshalling other assets besides cash values or um, bank information. Because think about this too, banks are federally mandated, so they may have a few different rules and things like that. But you are typically responsible from the day of the order. Now, I guess you could say it could be argued, especially with cash, that I really was not writing any checks or dispersing any money or accepting any money or doing anything of that nature. You have the ability to, you just don't have the ability to write checks or do a few other things. But mm -hmm. um, so, well, let me back up. Let's, uh, let's start this over a little bit. If you have a decedent, of course, this day is the date of death and it's not the date of an order or date of a letters. So when I said that, I should have clarified that would only be for a conservatorship or a guardianship okay the other important thing to understand here is i use the example say for instance you were able to go obtain a bank statement and the bank statement let's say ran from march 1st through March 31st, right? Because it's going to take you a minute to do your inventory and appraisal. Um, if that, if and when that should happen, please understand you do not want to take um, the balance on March 1st because legally you were not responsible for any funds from March 1st to March 8th. You're only responsible on that March 8th date, using my example here, responsible. So some people say, well, how the heck do I know what the balance was on that date or anything like that? I Some banks are nice and they'll almost, they will give you a daily, what is the balance on every specific day? Um, and then other banks not so easy, right? Either you can go to the bank and ask what the balance was on this specific date, or you can do a tiny bit of backtracking. So if I say, okay, it's March 1st, the balance was this, um, 
and I'm not going to deduct out the maybe checks that clear prior or things like that, you can kind of get what your beginning balance is. But um, we're going to go through attachment one, cash assets, attachment two, non-cash assets, what that means. Again, I'm teaching this for more for pro pers, but um, so you all may pretty much know all this, but I'm going to still go through it. Um, so you'll see this date, why it's important, where I pull it, um, what I use it for, and things like that as we go through the rest of the material. Does anybody have any questions or comments or anything already up to this point? Nope, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> so yes, we're going to camera. This is Helen. Hi. Good morning. Yes, hon. Can you um, have Rex make his screen a little bit bigger? I finally got to my computer and I can't see the bigger. Computer. Yes, ma'am. Thank uh -oh. you. Let's see what I can do here. Is that better? A little bit more. Is that better? Thank you. You've got two inches <laughs> on the right. Uh, gotcha. Okay. So is it full screen, you all? Uh, yeah. OK, good. Sorry and about that. I wish somebody was said something it earlier. Move, it helps to move the slider, though, too, uh, over on, you know, separating the pictures from the. I'm know, sorry, the what was that? It does help to move the slider, though, too, to make the, the, the names of the participants smaller. And it makes this bigger when you do that. Great. OK. Sorry, guys. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and go into um, attachment one. Keep in mind, attachment one is cash, cash, and I can't say that anymore. It's just cash. Um, so what does that mean? I'm going to give examples, and I'm going to go through quite a few things that are listed on as a cash asset. You all know you would put the estate of and the case number up top, and you would mark this as attachment one. Keep in mind for those, I'm not sure, I'm sure, I, I don't know if everybody's completed an inventory and appraisal, but you will see, sorry, let me go back. This is the DE 160 decedent's estate 160 or GC guardianship conservatorship 040. So the attachment is going to be the DE-161 or the GC-041. So it only goes up one number. This typically is blank. So you would have to indicate what attachment it is. So we are going to do attachment one. We only have one page. And these are the items um, that we are going to list as cash assets. So cash found at the residence of the conservative. Um, I will tell you, as, as some of us older people, I am part of that older generation, <laughs> um, many of the elderly people have cash on them, uh, almost all. My dad always had cash. Now me personally, I rarely have cash on me, rarely, like really rarely um, use my ATM card or my phone for everything. The older generation did not do that. They always had cash. So um, unfortunately, my elderly father passed away in January, but um, and I was helping him um, through his later years. And he'd go, hey, can you do me a favor and go to the bank and get me $200 of cash? And I was like, what? Why? Like, what are you doing with that? Um, he wanted to pay cash to his gardener. He wanted, I don't know, a handyman who came by or he just wanted cash and paid for everything with cash. Um, I take him to the grocery store. Dad, use your ATM card. No, I got cash. Um, so this is not unusual for a conservative to have some type of cash. 
Now, um, depending on if you're a fiduciary or a family member, might be a little bit trickier to walk into a conservative's house and say, hey, by the way, can I see your wallet or something like that to see if there is any cash? But you really want to record if there's any cash um, here that they have in their wallet on the hand because you are responsible from uh, the date of the order that is your appointment to know exactly if there is any cash on that the conservative has. Okay, balance in a checking account. I always uh, go on the not including the entire bank account number. I myself only include the last four digits of the bank um, account. Um, it is for safety purposes. Anybody can pull an inventory and appraisal, especially if it's a, for a conservatee, which means they're still alive. You're keeping the accounts functioning in most cases. In other cases, you really don't care because you've um, you're transferring into a different account. Um, so, but I still will only include the last four digits. And I will say I have seen examples where somebody has included the entire account number and the court has sent, let's say, a nice stern letter back to either the law firm or the preparer that states um, you need to practice security and other things for this conservative and they were not very happy that the full account number was given um now in this example they used the bank name and where it was located i do not tend to do this especially if i'm just saying wells fargo or bank of america i don't need to date where the branch is. Um, and so I do not include anything more than the name of the bank. Now you will know this is balances. And again, it's balances on this date. If by chance, you accidentally, let's say, put the balance on March 1st. Again, I'll use that statement idea. You put the balance on March 1st, and on March 1st, this balance was 8000 some other amount of money. I guarantee the probate examiners um, will catch and completely reject um, the entire accounting. I mean, the entire inventory and appraisal because bank statements, and we'll get into that later, will be turned in and they know what they're looking for. Um, also, you will note that when you're doing an accounting, which we'll get to later, um, you will not ever balance if, if this is not the correct number. Okay, I'm also going to indicate the balance in the savings account. Again, I only use the last four digits. Again, I only use the bank name. I do not list the address. Here's the balance. In this case, we had um, CDs or one CD. I, again, really don't think I would list the entire certificate but we have who it's issued by. Again, I would not include the entire address, and but I would include the names. And in this case, um, you have it in husband and wife's name, but looks like husband is deceased. As joint tenants state that it's automatically 100% the conservatees, and the amount. I This is unlikely. I've really not seen it very often. Um, 
but it's an example of a cash asset. And the reason being is this CD can quickly be turned into cash as opposed to you think. Analyst say, high. Sorry? That was odd. But anyway, um, can be turned into cash. So um, it um, is considered technically cash or a cash asset. Now, some of these examples as we get down have really are, are not really good examples because typically they don't happen this way, but I'm going to go through them anyway. So this conservator went into the conservatee's home and let's say on the dining room table there was a stack of mail that was unopened um, or it could even be open but nothing was done with it um, and in this case there was a pension check that was received on March 1st and again, we're going to use that March 8th date of appointment. Um, it was not cashed. So um, in this case, you would list an uncashed check. The date of the check and payable to the conservatee. But nowadays, and the reason why I say this is nowadays, these are direct deposited. So you may not see pension checks often. Another one, Social Security. I think nowadays those are all um, direct deposited. So it would be unlikely that you would find an uncashed Social Security check, but Believe me, there's been situations where you'll find things and you're trying to figure out if you can still cash them or not because maybe they're so outdated. And I think banks and people who are issuing checks, whether they're pension companies, Social Security or other vendors, are nowadays being very limited in how long that check is good for. So that's another thing that you have to consider when you find things of that nature is not only do I have a check, but is it a valid check? The other thing is if you see something that's old and dated like that, that's typically one of my first responses to possibly go to the state of California's unclaimed property because um, banks and other institutions are under that type of law. If there was a check issued and they find that it has not been cashed, they're supposed to release um, or send those funds over to the state of California. And then you go through that whole system in figuring out if there are any assets that you have to now wrestle. And I'm not kidding when I say wrestle the state of California to um, give them to you or get them to the conservative. And it takes a very long time for any of you who have attempted that. Um, it's a long time. Anyway, um, so in this case, we have an uncashed check. And then there's also a dividend check. So again, you have two different when you have, in this case, we had a, we have a mutual fund and there's two different ways that mutual funds pay out. They'll either reinvest the dividends or they will issue a dividend check. So keep that in mind. You will take all of these totals and you will bring it down to it says total cash assets. I typically write total attachment one or total attachment one assets and list the number, but that can be either or. I will take this number 578459 
And I'll drop that number right here. Any questions on attachment one assets? Keep in mind, oh, let me say one more thing. Keep in mind, this could include, what was it? I think I read the other day and I don't even know what city it was, but um, I think it was a decedent or, yeah, I think it was a decedent where they found like $100,000 worth of pennies in bags in maybe a storage unit or the garage or something. And I was like, oh, Lord, like I, <laughs> my eyes would be, I'm really not having to count all that, right? <laughs> Does anybody have any other um, examples that my I may not have mentioned that you would put as a cash asset? So just to confirm that like a 401k would be on attachment two, not one? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We're going to get over there. One of the challenges, a question for you, though, if we find something like foreign currency, we don't necessarily know the value until we take it to the bank and they give us a value. So we would report it here, but we but we really couldn't do that until after we had an idea of what the value was. Honey, you wouldn't complete your inventory and appraisal until you have that dollar number from the bank and then you would provide the amount like say, let me just use rubies. Um, you would state the amount and then bank gave value on this specific day and um then you would list the proper value go ahead okay on the foreign currency question you can look up the the transfer rate on the internet for any date for any currency so if you add up the the, the bills and it says a thousand of rupees or something you go to the internet and find out what it was on the date of the inventory and appraisal yeah, one of the one of the challenges that we had in this particular instance, the bank was going through trying to figure out looking at the date of the document and if it was one that they still accepted because currencies change sometimes, like euros right. and things like that. Right? right. But again, I would in myself, I would um do the transmitting or getting that value before I would attempt an inventory and appraisal or even start it. Well, in this particular case, we found it after we had done the original INA. So we, so we probably, so you did it corrected. We should have done a partial or something. Well, you could have done a partial, but once you found the value changed, I, uh, okay. I would have done a corrected. Okay. Okay. And list what the proper value was at the beginning. Because will you go ahead. Will you revisit the the differences, a uh, corrected versus a partial and some of those? Well, okay. So a partial, why won't my screen change? A partial would be so uh, let's say the difference between partials and things like that. I have some attorneys who do things several different ways. I have one where she does a partial because you might be having a house sale real quick. Now you don't really know you know there's a car in the garage and you know there's there might be some property um, in the state. There might be some property outside the state. Again, you're really only valuing um, in state. But there could be a few things that you just haven't had time to figure out all your assets but you have a sale coming up or they want the house to be sold. Let me use the example. So they have, and I'm talking a probate, this happens mostly in probate, um, where they want to get a mobile sold because the decedent's been gone for a while, the mobile home 
park is a little upset that it is left vacant um, for as long as it's been left vacant. It's been broken into two times already um, because people know it's vacant. And so we're worried about the value of the um, mobile because um, you're worried about it being broken into more or having to use the decedent's money for the repairs, stuff like that. She'll go through and do a partial for the house sale so she can get value and then wait to do another partial later um, later on or a final later on to list the other assets. Um, a corrected one is, and I've used this many times, especially with propers, where they have given the wrong balance um, or the uh, the wrong balance on the day of their appointment. Like I said, they've used a wrong date. Maybe they've used letters date. Maybe they've used statement dates. Maybe they didn't know a balance. Maybe... They came up with, like I always laugh, um, where I've seen them where they take a guess at the beginning when they're filling out the petition and they'll say, oh, I think there's about $3,000 in there. They go through to do their inventory and appraisal and they go, oh, I listed on the original petition that the balance in the account was $3,000. So they put $3,000 again, but then when it comes to turning it in and they have bank statements, the examiners are going, uh, there's no 3,001 for you to get to that exact penny is unusual. So that's the first thing I'll look at if I see an exact penny number um, and things like that. So there are different reasons for corrected. I know several LDAs, and I'm not going to say her name, I'm hoping she'll just pipe up, that use several, they'll do the partials just in case um, they want to get, okay, so the other thing would be if you wanted to hurry up and get the probate referee to value attachment to, but you don't know exactly what all of your cash assets are, or you haven't been able to get bank statements or information from the bank yet, but you know um, what property there is, or you know the vehicles and you know other things. So you just want to hurry up and get it off to the probate referee because maybe the probate referee, not maybe they do take a long time. Um, you can do partials and really just send your attachment to if you know that very easily right away. Um, and then later come back and add your attachment one. So, I mean, there's several different reasons um, that you would do a partial as opposed to just doing one final. But in our example, especially trying to explain all that to pro pers, they wouldn't know what that means. What do you mean send attachment to, to the probate referee and get all into those details? It's really not taught, but those are examples on why there may be more than one partial or you would use partial instead of a final. But sooner or later, you have to get to a point where you're indicating to the court that this is it. Like, <laughs> these are my numbers. Like, you don't want to keep doing like four partials and they're like looking, going, okay, are we ending at some point? Um, a lot of, there's been times that I've seen where they haven't been so picky where person may turn in more than one final. So they do a final, they figured out they were wrong. I would have done a corrected, but they turn around and do a second final. And that has worked. Um, again, this would be a pro per, and I'm only seeing the accounting part after it was done because I would never suggest 
they do it that way. Um, if I've already marked it a final and I need to make a correction, I'm coming back with a correction. Oh, the other thing to that, the reason I remember now um, that partials are used by some LDAs or paralegals are, say for instance, you mark this as a final, you send it off with attachment one, what you think is attachment one, you think it's proper. And then you go get it done by the probate referee and he signs it off and then there's a total down here. And then say, for instance, you figure or find there's an extra car that was buried under boxes of stuff that's in a garage or a shed or out in a barn or somewhere on a property, right? And you didn't list that vehicle. You would have to do a, a corrected or a new one to have the probate referee include that vehicle as opposed to if you only sent him a partial up front and found another vehicle or something like that then you would just do a um, another partial or a final or something like that and um, have him only correct so say we did a second partial, he would only value then the car as opposed to re-evaluing everything on attachment two. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, I, go ahead. Sorry. I was, I'm going to lower my hand because you actually uh, said what I was going to say. I do partials until I get to the final because I don't want the probate referee to have to redo everything so I try to group like items together until I get to the final so I you know usually I can have at least four or five different ones before I get to my final because we know the attachment one is the easiest of them and then how many times does the probate if you put everything on the attachment two and give it to the probate referee and then there's a mistake you got to redo all of that on that attachment too. So I just find it easier to break it up and then have that final, especially, you know, uh, the tax certification, if there's real property. And if there's even more than one piece of real property, I put those on separate attachments. Yeah. Interesting. When, I've never when is, Go ahead. I was wondering when is supplemental used? Helen, you want to answer since you answer the other Look, one? I've wondering? never, I've never used supplemental, but I, I realize that in probate that we use a supplement to, you know, to some. I usually use corrected. So if I have to correct one of my shows, but I have the opportunity to supplement something. Yeah, I myself just through my experience and what I've seen, um, the supplemental or um, it is kind of like a partial or a supplemental can be like a corrected. Um, I don't see it much, but a supplemental would be um, more or less. Uh, I don't think you could use a supplemental much on an attachment to because that is the probate referee's value. Um, but I have many people who use, um, they'll do the first one as a partial, the next ones as a supplement, and then record a final. Um, but I don't think there's a ironclad, you must do it this way. I think you do what you find works for you. Um, I'll tell you, knowing the probate referees, um, knowing who they are, using them enough, you kind of get what they like. Um, I am sure they don't like seeing quite a few different supplements coming through and them revaluing and they're thinking I did this already and um, on and on. They do get paid based on the value. There's, um, they are limited in 
the rate they could charge, the value. Um, I used to be able to, when we get to attachment two, be um, a little bit less descriptive. Like say, for instance, if I wanted to give um, a car or I found a car, it used to be I just gave the year make and model and then kind of the condition of it. Um, because as you know, with cars, it's all based on the condition. Now, um, the probate referees are coming back. They like to see VIN. Some like to see title. Some, you know, like really want a lot more information. So I think it's working with your probate referees, getting your stuff back, figuring out what works for you and what works for courts. Cause I will tell you, I have um, many court, I use LA Stanley mosque. I use orange County um, down South, but I myself am North um, Bay or up Contra Costa, Alameda, um, Marin, this area, every, every court's different. So I think you need to just, figure out what works for you and see what they accept or what they like to see. Or if say they, you found it easier to do one way and then one time you start getting it rejected or they give comments um, or list deficiencies or something like that you change, but there's no set in stone. You have to do it this way. Thank you. Any, any more comments or questions on that one? Because we'll move to attachment two. I have a I question. have a question about attachment one. Okay. Um, would you put cryptocurrency on attachment one or two? That's a good question. I think crypto would go on attachment two because crypto is like one of those that has a changing value also right like foreign currency uh -huh. Ellen have you done crypto I stay away from it no all right yeah. no I haven't but I would put it on two because right. I think that's one of those things that you have it's almost like stock yeah I would let a probate referee value that okay thank you one of the one of the scary things that I've heard about crypto, um, and it might be changing, but that most crypto you cannot name a beneficiary. So that means that that um, I would have to take that asset into my own name to be able to do something about it. So if there's crypto in a case, I'm a little leery. Right, right, me too. I'll be like, um, uh, you might want to see an attorney for all that. <laughs> But then if you got it as a paralegal and did it through an attorney law firm, yeah, I've, I've not gotten um, one where I've had to do an inventory and appraisal with crypto, but I'm like the others. I would put it on um, number attachment two, not one. I wouldn't consider it cash because cash is really just something that you can easily take and turn into cash. Again, like those bags of pennies. Hey, am I the only one that knows about this story about recently about these bags of pennies that somebody found in a decedent's garage? And literally they were stacks and stacks and stacks of like um, bags full of pennies. I, I think I would have freaked out. <laughs> like, oh my God, maybe go get like... I don't even know if the court would like you to use one of those coin machines that collect, what, three or four cents for every dollar. Um, would they like you doing that and losing money on the counting part? But what, I don't even think you can take a bag of coins like that to the bank anymore. I don't know. You used to be able to get the um, paper roller, you know, the papers and roll your own money and turn them in that way. I, I don't even think you can do that anymore, but I don't know. Any more questions, all? Okay, I'm going to slide over to attachment two. So attachment two is very much going to look like attachment one. Again, you're going to label attachment two. 
page one of one because I only have um, one page. And I'm gonna go through how you would list, and I do mine a tiny bit different, but I'm gonna go through how you would list non-cash assets or assets. Basically, I also call this assets that will be valued by the probate referee. Okay, we in our case, we have a real property, city of Newport Beach, County of Orange, state of California, described as, I absolutely will put that information. I myself um, do look at deeds for the legal description. If you do not have the ability to pull a deed, there are several services and different title agencies, um, escrow offices, stuff like that, that you can possibly inquire about and like pay for. Um, say it's a dollar, two dollars, I think it's only a dollar or something like that to pay for a deed, but I always take this off the deed. Okay, I myself break mine down a little bit. I would put a space between described as semicolon, um, lot would come down a line. I will list the legal um, description which is you could find on Schedule A, Attachment A, or it will be in the center part down below of the deed. I also would put this property is commonly known as on a separate line item. But before I do that, so this starting here would go down here, but I list the APN number first. And that's the only thing on the line. Then I'll go down two lines or break it up. And then I will state property commonly known as. I do not include improved with a single family dwelling or anything like that. Oh, also at the beginning of the sentence, and I don't know if anybody else does this, but common practice to me, I will typically state whether it's 100% interest, 50% interest, 25% interest. Now, if it's lower than 100, you need to state um, the percentage of interest, but I even do it when it's... Um, 100%, I'll put 100% interest in the real property in the city of Newport Beach um, and list it that way. You never put a value here, even if you've ran Zillow, Redfin, kind of know your value. Even if um, there's a sale, occasionally... Um, if I know we already have a sale, we already have a contract, we already have something, I will separately on a sticky note indicate to the probate referee, um, especially if, let's say you have um, a house somewhere that the entire inside is like uninhabitable or you have major electrical or say you have foundation issues something like that I typically will put that like on a sticky note to the probate referee just to let them know that um it's not a typical let's go easy house throw it on the market and whether we had to take a lower value because of that um, I will also indicate if there are any other issues with the property that um, it would be a lower value. I'll also include if there are any major upgrades, say, for instance, the person had just completely remodeled the kitchen or, you know, turned it's no longer a three bedroom, it's a two bedroom bedroom, big bedrooms, or anything like that, I will indicate that to him. Okay, second one, vacation home, um, same information. I myself break mine up a little bit so that it, they, so, and the reason why I do that, I, 
there are just certain little things I really want to stand out when you have all these numbers and stuff all over in here. It might not be easy to see an APN number. Typically, it's real easy if you know the APN number to run any information. Um, so I'd like to keep that out separately. The commonly known as when you're looking in here trying to really find the address, um, I like mine to stand out a little bit. I have no idea if the probate referees like it better that way, like it less that way. I've never heard here or there, but that's just the way I do. Household furnishings. I typically, unless like most of the time I find that, especially with a conservatorship or a decedent's estate, most people feel the furnishings are not worth, uh, they're put outside free or they're donated or garbage can pickup. I'll tell you, I did that like with my father's house. I had to quickly get on the market. Um, I, I just didn't have time or energy to figure out if I could do an estate sale or anything like that. Um, so many people are different that I would not even have listed his household furniture unless it's actually really nice pieces um, and you want to list household furniture. Um, be careful about this, though. Don't like say you have um, antique hutch hutches full of china or something like that. That's really not a part of household furniture. Um, household furniture, I typically see given a value of about 500. That's the most I've ever really seen a probate referee value household furniture. Um, because like things like beds, they really can't be sold again. It, it really just depends on what you're walking into, whether I would include household furniture or not. But this tells you where it's at. Is it at the primary residence or is it at the vacation? In this case, it's at the primary residence. Funny thing is our sample did not include any furniture at the vacation home. Odd, but okay. <laughs> Next, I'm going to go through, um, so again, if you have, let's say, a grand piano, that's not, as you know, part of household furniture. That's completely something totally different. Maybe you have Persian rugs, or maybe the funny thing is I'm one of those, I don't know if I could walk in and determine if a rug was a Persian expensive rug or not, um, but you know, you'll get the, um, and typically if you're doing this for a law firm, you're counting on the decedent's family member to tell you what's there. So you're not looking at anything. Um, when I say looking at things, that's more for conservatorships and more for like fiduciary firms, um, whether they do that or not. Um, so. But remember, here is my thing. I always like to say, state everything that you think has value. Because think about this. When you have beneficiaries, which I have, I don't think Rex, he used to have it here. With a beneficiary, I, <laughs> we used to have a picture that was like seagulls, a bunch of seagulls out on the beach and every seagull is squawking where's my money where's my money where's my money where's my money and it was a funny thing him and I used to have because it was like that's phone call after phone call after phone call after phone call we get like when am I getting my money where's my money how do I know how much money I'm getting um blah 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 anyway the reason why I like to be very descriptive about things, especially on the inventory and appraisal, is it goes to all, it can be seen, goes to all beneficiaries. And they can see, for instance, what you have and what you've listed as their parent, grandparent, 
um, friend, whatever. And if there's anything that if they ever felt that you were hiding something or trying to be deceptive, oh, you didn't state the paintings, you didn't state the $100,000 of pennies I know he has in the garage, you didn't state certain other little things um, that changes your credibility. It really does. Um, and the liability. If you've listed everything that you can think of that would have value, um, and again, maybe something is found later on and you need to do a corrected or a supplemental, um, that's totally different. But I'm saying just try not try, do your very best to find everything that the either decedent or conservative or minor has. You pretty much know for minors because it's typically, well, it could be cars, vehicles, something left by a decedent parent or grandparent. Um, and if they're not old enough to receive or say maybe they have some type of challenge um, health-wise, mentally-wise, um, some other reason um, a guardianship is obtained for them. Again, you're responsible for everything and all pennies and all assets of that person. Okay, we're going to move down to investments in mutual funds um, at Safeguard. And this can get a little bit tricky on, um, and this might be a reason you do more than one um, partial so you don't have to worry about corrected is trying to figure out how many shares of what um, you may have in a mutual fund to list only one kind of makes me laugh because there are, it's never just one. Um, usually you're listing quite a few different things and um the other little tiny challenge that i go through with mutual funds is figuring out um the name on that mutual fund sometimes it's still husband and wife husband passed sometimes it's husband and wife one got divorced like okay now who owns what I have a conservative who can't really remember or was is able to talk to me. Um, there's times where um, I'll get mutual funds and let's say I'm doing a conservatorship from her and then I'll figure out the mutual fund that was found was in the husband's name, but he's deceased, but it never transferred to her. So is it really hers? You don't want to list, like, say, for instance, grandpa's mutual fund um, if it's not in her name specifically. Um, and there's just been all kinds of different stories about mutual funds and the shares of um, the mutual funds or um, things like that. So allow your probate referee to have as much information as you have so that he can figure out the value. Now, Rex would say something else. Rex would say, I can go online and at any time I just type in the initials of the um, investment and it will tell me the value and blah, blah, blah. I don't go through all of that. Okay, in this case, we have seven U.S. savings bonds. I don't see this either. And I get down to diamond wedding ring. I am always very specific in this, um, especially because I have at least two or three cases right now um, regarding wedding rings and... Um, I'll give you one example that a uh, decedent had more than one ring. Uh, maybe she started off with one carrot and then later got a two and then lastly passed away. And I think she had a uh, four carrot and the, um, maybe this was a, tr was this a trust? Cause it was a trustee, but anyway, um, the administrator, 
No, because she left instructions. So I think it was a trust. And um, so the trustee, part of the trust said, give my, um, maybe it said, give my engagement ring to my grandson to give to his wife. And the trustee ended up giving the wedding ring, which was the four carat and not the engagement one, which is the one carat. I'm not sure if that was a deceptive or she really just accidentally didn't read or figure it out. He had already given the ring to his fiance and now um, other, I think it's sisters are fighting to get it back because they want him to have what was his and then they want um, the other rings. Um, I have a hard time thinking about this sometimes because I myself am not a ring or a carrot expert, nor do I, is that important to me? So I I don't even know if I know the difference between a one or a two carrot. I, maybe I would, but I'm not sure. Um, I definitely would know between a two and a four um, because it would look bigger, right? That's all I would know about it. But I would be very specific in this because, um, and any other type of jewelry that, um, you would maybe think would hold a value because it is um it is litigated a lot um paintings also for some reason um but then you get into other issues that the conservatee gave paintings away before they were conserved and then you have families fighting that she got more or less, whatever. Um, I would just be, I like to be as transparent as possible and list as much as possible. Um, other things I would list as non-cash assets, say there was a horse or any other type of animal like that, maybe goats, maybe cows, um, farm animals, um, let's say collectible cars right here. I don't even see any car listed. Um, what are other things? Anybody else want to give other things they list on attachment to? Nobody, huh? Okay. Um, I'll add with reference to the pictures that in one probate, I had pictures from an artist, a local artist, and the referee was not able, I, we gave them nice pictures of the painting. <laughs> and the referee, we were told that that was outside of their scope and that we'd have to go to an art appraiser in order to get it appraised and then bring it back to the referee. Oh, nice. <laughs> because, the uh, because my artist was still alive, so there was no real value yet. Oh, so yeah, yeah. But he was a famous artist, so after his death, of course, it would have a value. Correct. I, I know I have one of those, well, in Benicia, California, because that's my somewhat area. There's a really good artist um, that a lot of people have his paintings, but some people feel their value is a lot more than others. So I could definitely see how paintings would be a difficult thing. Any others? Okie dokie. Anyway, so on attachment two, you will see we have no values. That is not for us to value. That is for the probate referee. You will get this back and these the values will be typed in here. So every line item you've listed will have a value and he or she will give a total value and that value will be transferred to this part. I've seen many times where um, they've written the total, and then I've seen other times where the probate referee will not total it and allow you to total it. So, 
So now we have our total of um, our numbers. We're going to go down and complete the rest of it. You are going to indicate if attachment one and two together are all of your assets or a portion. You can imagine if you've marked final, they're all. If you've marked a portion that were, um, they would only be uh, partial, they would only be a portion. You have stated here that you truly, honestly, and impartially appraise to the best of your ability. That's your only requirement is the best of your ability. As long as you can say that, then there's no worries. There's nobody who's going to hold you to a higher standard, but what was the best of your ability. Okay, we have box number four. Um, I usually ask the propers this, but I'm going to kind of leave it and go through it. Um, no probate referee is required. That means um, that when you completed your DE-111 petition, or if there's a conservatorship, you have your GC, I'm going to say 310, or if it's a minor, it can, I think it's the same one, um, that you indicated there were no non-cash assets. So in this case, maybe the conservatee only had a bank account only had, um, yeah, basically only had a bank account, nothing more. You would not need a probate referee. Now, nine times out of 10, you will have a probate referee. That probate referee is going to be listed on your order, which is the DE-140. At the bottom left-hand side, before the judge signs, literally, it's the probate referee is the last line and the judge signs like right here on, not this form, but on the DE-140. So that's how you will always determine who your probate referee is. You will put the date of the order. And we are going to continue on. Now you have property tax certificate. You're either going to mark A or B. A is person did not own any real property. And this will say at the time of death, but. And or B, you have notified the county assessor through an affidavit of death of trustee, through a change of property owner, um, death of real property owner, all those kinds of things. So you will need to mark one or two. Then you are going to declare under penalty of perjury, all this information is true. I always tell um, pro pers that you do not ever sign or date until you receive this back from the probate referee. So this is going to be the proper or the client, the petitioner. And you're going to continue down the rest of the form. We're going to talk about bond. Either bond was waived because you could be a corporate or a sole fiduciary or bond was waived by beneficiaries or a will or a trust or several ways bond can be waived. Or the bond was filed in the amount, typically your um, minimum amount is 20,000. I always ask propers that were on there, if I have a $20,000 bond and my cash is 57, would my bond be sufficient or insufficient? Anybody want to quickly answer? I'll what go was ahead. the question? Okay, if you're, if the court orders you a $20,000 minimum bond, you show cash of 57,844.59. Is your bond sufficient or non-sufficient? Non-sufficient. Correct. Now, 
That doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean you're wrong, you're bad, you're anything like that. That allows the court under its own discretion to determine whether they want to increase the bond or not. That's all it does. But you are marking whether your bond is sufficient or non-sufficient. And it, it used to be, although I'm seeing other judges say differently, it used to be that... Does the bond cover cash? And as long as the bond covers the cash, it's sufficient. Nowadays, the probate referees, well, depending on to how, I'm sorry, the probate judges, depending on if there's limited or um, if you have full authority, are counting the property and wanting property, they add both of these together, and then they want the bond to be sufficient for the entire property. And I'm seeing that a little bit more down in LA area than up here, but I know um, probate judge for Alameda Can County Sundin, um we recently, uh, we had to put, which is the other one, funds in a blocked account, um, the sale of the home. He wanted it in a blocked account. And um, we were trying to do a request for withdrawal of funds from a blocked account because we were final distributing. And um, it used to be you could take that request and say, Your Honor, I want to transfer funds from a um, blocked account, which is what I had it in, a blocked account, and I want to transfer it down to a regular account. And then the regular account, my administrator already had checks um, because they ordered checks ahead of time. Um, the judge said no. He would not allow that, that they want now the request for withdrawal of funds from a blocked account to they want the bank to issue directly the cashier's check to the decedent i'm sorry to the beneficiaries so i had to redo and in this case i had close to 50 beneficiaries um but i had to list on a one i think i turned it in at five pages or something, but I had to list every beneficiary, the amount um, they were going to get and um, how I wanted the bank to indicate on the check in the memo line, it was um, what it was for because they have, the judges have found that so many times, like so many times, that they've released funds from a blocked account, it went into a regular account and then money disappeared. And they're like, okay, say for instance, he only issued a $20,000 bond or no bond because the money was in a blocked account. Typically, if money goes into a blocked account, they won't they won't require a bond because they know they have control. But as soon as that money left the court's control, disappeared, bam, they can't get it back. Or they, let's say, can't find the person or there's a whole lot of other issues involved in what's going to happen now. So the courts are getting a little bit tight with money because it's, and don't think it as, oh my gosh, they're being a pain in the royal neck and requiring us to do so much more than is necessary. My goodness, it's in a blocked account. I already have to pay the $60 to petition the court for the request um, to remove from the blocked account. Now it's like I've got a list every, it's a pain. Well, again, they're only protecting the money for the beneficiaries and trying to make sure it gets to the proper hands as opposed to the improper hands. So again, in some cases, you may say um, there's money in a blocked account. I will tell you for guardianships, 
money is in a blocked account, typically. Okay, so we're going to date it. If there's a lawyer, um, this is where he or she will sign. If there is only a pro per, no lawyer, they must sign both places where their name and signature goes on both places. And we are going to slide over to page two. Okay, up at the top, same information. Your probate referee will state what he is charging for um, his valuing the attachment to. He will also state if there are any expenses, which could include mileage, parking, bridge toll, anything like that. If he had to pay for copies of something, um, that would all be included. And there will be a total right here. Again, that total is how much is this probate referee going to charge for his service? That is the only thing you're going to see on this site. He will sign, date, and then it will come back to you um, to get the client's signature. So any questions? I am completely done with the inventory and appraisal. We're going to move over into the accounting. You are going to see, and I'm going to slide up so don't get dizzy. You are going to see how this entire section starts your accounting. It starts your summary at your beginning pages. And everything about the accounting starts off these numbers. Any questions before I take off and let Rex come in? Y'all are awesome. I'll be back. See you soon. Thank you. Okay, so you went through all the inventory and appraisal, right? Okay. Hello. We're going to switch gears here and start grinding out some forms let me see here uh we can come back to that one um one of the things i uh like to cover is if you're going to be doing court accounting you know there's all this discussion about can't call yourself a cpa and different things like that whatever can't call yourself a lawyer but virtually anyone can do court accounting you don't have to have any license there's no requirement and i don't think it's a legal service you're just doing accounting in a format that the california courts want um as part of accounting probate's required it's required on guardianship and conservatorships um, after your first year and then every odd year after that first third fifth year you have to turn in an annual accounting um, for trusts there's no requirement to turn in an annual accounting however if a trustee or beneficiary asks for an accounting you're required to give them one and sometimes we'll take accountings for trustees and bring them for court approval to relieve the trustee of liability once everything is disclosed, then the trustee would not have liability for claims against uh, from a from a beneficiary because they had a right to express their objections to the accounting but it is optional for trust, not optional for guardians, conservatorships, and probates. Uh, some other formatting issues. You always have to turn in all your court accounting and um, portrait view, eight and a half on the top, the 11 down the side. And it needs to be at least 12 point type uh, we turned in a spreadsheet one time for rental properties and it looked beautiful. They just kicked it right back. They said, we can't take landscape. Okay, we'll do it a different way. Uh, let me move to 
my section here. So, you know, you guys are too quiet. Somebody ought to start talking, but uh, <laughs> you do what you want. Um, okay, so I want to go to, uh, not that. There we are. Okay, so I don't know what camera pointed out or not, but in the class materials that um, the one that she's been going through, the one, the first page is the handbook for conservators. Okay, this was put out by Judicial Council for State of California. Judge Sugiyama was on the committee to help develop this. It's about maybe 100 pages. It's available online and it gives all kinds of information about the responsibilities and duties of guardianships, conservators, and other fiduciaries. It's free online if you want it. I just let you know. We pulled the parts out about accounting. Um, and let me go through some other things. Okay. So in the handout material we had links that were went to our google cloud that had our class materials and we also included the class materials on the invitation to the zoom but i wanted to explain some of the things about the handouts so you know that they're there before i get too far into the weeds on um they the court. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I uh, have my PDF on read out loud, but I didn't think I wanted to do that today. <laughs> I turn a lot of material into audio so I can review it at 200% speed. So we have pointing out materials that are there for you, resources. The one that says handout three, non-follow along handout is, um, I put it together to help give you additional background information. And um, it has common errors and, and this information was pulled from a court website. Um, this material, when you get heavy into court accounting and you get into split interest trusts that have um, a beneficiary getting current income and then someone else getting a uh, the remainder, it creates a lot of uh, accounting details. And uh, what I've included is a cross-reference. It's not up to date, but it shows the probate code section based on a series of issues. So it, it, it's a reference to help you uh, identify things. And uh, it's quite useful if you need it. And it also breaks it out whether you're gonna, supposed to post it to the, the principal of the assets or the income. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you another accounting report. All our forms and instruction is on the government judicial council forms but you can also prepare things in uh, spreadsheet format. And other than the GC 400 sum, which we're going to cover in a moment in detail, um, you can use spreadsheets. We make a, a spreadsheet program available. is basically a Excel template that we sell for $50, not super extensive, but it is shows the outline. There's the form for it. And then in the uh, in that handout three, I uh, talked to probate examiners and they gave me copies of their checklists of things that they look at when they get filings and including accountings, accounting on trusts, accounting on conservatorship. So you can use this so your accounting report doesn't bounce when it gets filed by the probate examiners. It's quite helpful. And that's about it on that one. Um, what else is there? Uh, and, and I'll just point it out for later, but we did include um, 
an evaluation of the course, if you'd be so kind to fill that in and make suggestions. Um, the next thing I, I'm going to cover next, the most important form in the accounting process for fiduciary accounting. It's called the GC 400 sum for summary. And uh, they kind of came up with unusual ways to label and number these things. All our forms are GC 400 with some other letter behind it. Um, in our material, I have put Bates numbering in the lower left of each page. And I sometimes will refer to what I'm talking about by the page number. And what I mean by that is the, the big numbers here, 21, not the D12. Uh, and I'm not talking about these headings up here as page numbers. So we will be bouncing. If you printed this out or if you have it in a PDF and you want to put a bookmark in, we're going to go back and forth on this particular form quite a bit and so we will be back to it okay so summary of accounts this particular form it says adopted for mandatory use by the judicial council of california the judicial council is very much like the board of directors in our court system directly under the California Supreme Court. And they decide on what forms we will use and which ones are required. This one happens to be mandatory for all court accountings. And a lot of times when the reports are turned in spreadsheet, um, it has it in the same format, but then they need to trans. Uh, for the information onto the regular government form. And the, the required adopted for mandatory use are only in these areas for probate, guardianship, and conservatorships. It's for optional use if you're doing uh, accounting for a trust that you're turning into the court. Okay, so at the heading, there's no place, if you're doing a probate, just write it in on the top. If it's a trust, just write it in. And in this case, we're doing the first account. So when uh, Taylor probably mentioned, when you get appointed, you have, after the first 90 days, you have to turn in the inventory and appraisal. At the, after the end of the first year, you have to turn in the court accounting and every other year thereafter so it's one three five seven nine years and just list the the dates and whether it's a final or not which you would not file until you do your final petition um the other thing about the court accounting and when you're doing a probate um as you well know helen bellamy because you do a lot of probates um you have to have a cover sheet, not a cover sheet, but you have kind of like in a petition that's attached to your accounting as request for final distribution. And Tamara is going to cover that after I go through the uh, forms. So we'll get back to that. And that's more um, uh, pleadings on pleading paper. Anyway, Tamara spent time on explaining these two first lines. How do we get it? The term that's used in court accounting is carry value. If you take in rigor business accounting courses, they talk about basis and it's not the same. You, you cannot take court accounting directly and do a tax return from it because there are different rules, but it's helpful. Um, so what you end up with is carry value at the beginning of the account. It's a fixed dollar amount. And then you end up with the ending assets at the end of the account. And the bulk of the data that gets turned into the court are all the transactions in between. Uh, you only have to use the probate referee once in the beginning. 
and then those assets don't change carry value in the future. So these two numbers we've already talked about. So the way this form is structured, um, we have all the income and expenses. And of course, with legal, they can't use normal terms. So instead of saying income, they say charges. Instead of disbursements, they call them credits. Okay, so we have unusual wording. And these, uh, like receipts during the period, it says Schedule A, but it may be several pages, but this is the total of that group of forms. And you can kind of look at these numbers. I look at them like links that if, if it was a link, you can click here and then you go right back into the report where all the detail for that 43,000 uh, would be located. Then we go through disbursements, same thing, all these different subschedules. And then we'll deal with the ending asset values at the end of the account, which in this case, March 7th. Um, and then talk about balancing. Okay, so the beginning assets plus all the income comes up to the total charges. And it must balance everything that was paid out and the ending carry value for the assets. These two numbers must balance every time on this GC 400 sum summary. It's the first thing that the probate examiners will evaluate when accounting's turned in. And uh, unfortunately in tax, IRS does not want pennies and we round them off. They're worthless anyway, but the court's a little bit retentive in that regard. And you still have to account for every penny in the accounting process, which I kind of object to, but nobody asked me. Um, so in the disbursements, we're going to have gain or loss on sale. And here, is uh, a benefit line. Uh, say the estate has a trader business. So in court accounting, you have to handle every transaction, every bit of income, each transaction, each transactions for expenses. However, if there's a business, operating business, you can use the financial statement from the accountant on the business to just bring in the net income or just bring in the net loss from an income statement prepared by the CPA for the business instead of having to go through all those pages and, and include it in this fiduciary accounting. Another thing I like to point out, so you're going through these forms and we're going to go through a bunch of them. In the lower right is the statutory basis for this form. And I look at this, say if I under, want to find out what particular item, what am I talking about? This gives you the probate code sections that might provide some light on what they're looking for in this circumstance. So we have a series of probate code sections and then the California rules of court also uh, provides guidance. And uh, we just had a change to that rule of court, the 7.575, which I will cover. Uh, anyway, I call it a breadcrumb trail. So if you can't find something, you go back and try to find out why it's not clear. Um, another feature of the court accounting is if a line has no data on it, you're supposed to put a zero. And that way the court knows you're making an assertion. It isn't just that you failed to answer uh, and, it, and it's required here in the, the footnotes. Um, you'll see the phrase and I'll just dispel it right off, standard account or simplified accounts. 
standard account or simplified accounts. I don't talk about simplified accounts. It's um, more likened to just a check register and that you can only have five pages. Um, I don't do them. I you know only know one way to do them and that's not in the check register format, but you'll see that term and it may make sense. If you have, uh, you know, a, a conservatorship and they've got 12 deposits for the year and 12 disbursements for the year, the simplified account might be more useful for you. But I'm not going to cover it. Okay. So as we start out from our little journey here, this uh, GC400 sum is kind of like... Uh, the hub of a wheel. We're going to be going out and back all the time from this form. Okay, so this is uh, redundant, you know, deja vu all over again. Uh, these are the assets on hand at the beginning of the period. Well, didn't we just do the beginning inventory? Yes, but that's what the forms say. So uh, you just restate it from your inventory and appraisal, the cash items and the non-cash, and that'll match the numbers. Um, one thing that is uh, changes after your first account, so non-cash assets. So we had a house, let's say, that was appraised, and it has a carry value of a million, and What's it worth? Well, if it's at the same date as the appraisal, it's the same. So there is no difference in estimated value. But if you're doing an account five years later, the value of that house is probably different. And it's not that big of a deal, but you go out on Zillow or Truilio or some of the other sites and get an estimated market value of the house at the time of the, uh, in this case, the beginning of the account. And uh, it's also useful for accountings that have large stock portfolios, because sometimes trustees get in trouble. They've got, uh, they're not good money managers, and they invest in a bunch of stocks that go down in value. And if you report the value as you go through for all the stocks, uh, once the court accounting is approved by the judge, then it relieves the fiduciary of liability. Okay, this is a, it's an optional form. It's, uh, I kind of call it Rex's favorite form. And when we're going to be dealing with a lot of subschedules and, you know, the court wasn't too creative in coming up with these numbers, GC 400 on every form and then A1, C3. Anyway, um, if we have multiple schedules back in our report, this is a way to summarize it before you bring it to the GC 400 sum. And I like this because being an accountant, I it gives me the flow. I can trace the numbers from the subschedules um, back through here into the GC 400 sum. But this is not required. They say don't file it with your accounting. That's fine. Okay. Um, first of all, in court accounting, there's a couple exceptions. And if you can get out of court accounting, you might want to. Uh, one with guardianship and conservatorships, if the assets are less than 15,000, you can ask the court on um, a form, ex parte petition to dispense with accounting and order. And you get the judge to sign off saying you don't need to do one. It's just too small. Another time I have seen an accounting required, which was a mistake. 
in a conservatorship, husband and wife, husband became incapacitated, let's say with Alzheimer's, and then the court was going to require the wife to do a court accounting, which she had no experience and was very stressed about having to, this requirement. And when I looked at it, I go, this is ridiculous. All of the assets the husband and wife had were community property. So if one spouse is incapacitated, the other spouse manages the assets. And that's what it says in the probate code. It says the, the spouse with capacity has full control and they are not required to do an accounting along with a conservatorship case. Okay, so we're gonna look at receipts. You have to list every transaction. We have a stockbroker report, each one separately, maybe separated out by investment accounts. I frequently have put the last four digits of the um, investment account. And then we're running a total here. It's, it's not a cumulative total the way these forms are designed. It's a uh, per page. And then you have to go back and add each of the pages up. It's just an unusual way they designed it. Um, we're not going to cover anywhere near all the judicial council forms but there are just so you know 48 different <laughs> forms and schedules judicial council made available for your fiduciary accounting entertainment uh you're not going to need them all um, so we're looking here incomes by category in this case receipts and dividends fine um, in the area of dividends, if you have a large stock portfolio in the account, there's a thing called a dividend reinvestment program. And I abbreviate that DRIP, um, where you get dividends and you immediately tell the broker to buy more stock. Well, if you have a large stock portfolio, it'll drive you batty because every time there's a dividend you have to report the income every time there's a reinvestment you have to treat it as a new purchase of securities and it, it makes this circular entry every time and you'll get tired of it pretty soon and what i suggest is you tell the broker to stop the dis dividend reinvestment program put all the dividends from securities into cash and maybe once a year, I'll take the 40,000 and reinvest it in securities. So it's not a bunch of tiny transactions. Okay, so we'll move on to page number 24, receipts. Um, there again, we have what? Save interest bearing account, fine. List them each uh, bank account listed in a separate format. Uh, run your total. And then we'll go to pensions. On this form, they want pensions and annuities, but not Social Security. and you list each particular pension uh, pen uh, benefit, if there's withholding on the pension benefits, it's only the amount that came into the bank that you're um, required to report on. Okay, and page 26, uh, let's see. We have rents. Okay, on the rents, I would show them by property. If you have several properties, and um, just need to say, you know, I would put single-family residence. 
And this form, uh, the A4 form, is designed for receipts from rents, kind of passive income, which means it's not a trader business. If you have in the uh, estate assets, uh, other types of things like an Airbnb, a hotel, some others that are businesses, you do not list them here. It's only for passive transactions. Go to page 27, form A5. Are we having fun yet? Is anybody still awake? Can somebody say Ooh. something? I'm learning. Ooh. I'm learning. Thank oh, you. Oh, I'm learning. Good, good. I like Helen Bellamy being in this crowd because I'm uh, honored to have her in the class because she knows so much about probate. She'll leave me in the dust. And uh, I'm happy to share my information. Um, I just took probate class from Helen recently and it was excellent. So uh, thank you, Rex. You welcome. Did a wonderful job. I can see how we can use this. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah, and um, so we're talking about the government forms and, you know, it's rigid. Rex, and, yeah. This is Stephanie. I have a question back on the properties. Yes. So if they use a property management company, which collects the rents, pays the expenses, and then the amount that gets deposited into the bank account as a receipt is the adjustment of, how do you record that? Um, what? this form requires is the agent transactions being pulled right into the accounting. So all the rents need to still be reported. All the disbursements okay. still need to be expended. And I know what you're saying. Um, and you have to pull it apart. Uh, it's very similar to a stockbroker statement. Got it. You got all these transactions and you have to Pull them out like with chopsticks, one little thing at a time, and bring it into your accounting. Thank you very much. Sure. I'm happy to have questions. Okay. On the receipt Social Security other benefits, um, our local probate court requires the probate examiners to take our class. Each new probate examiner has to go through us. And one of the probate examiners was taking the class and she noticed this right off immediately. She goes, "That you can't do that. What? Remember I said you have to enter every transaction. You can't take it and report it by quarter. Not acceptable. So this would cause the accounting to get rejected. And... Um, I want to, the next term is called netting, N-E-T-T-I-N-G. Um, in accounting, we don't net transactions per se, like say if you have uh, rental income and you offset it against rental expense or something or interest income to interest expense. Uh, you can't do that. It's not uh, the way the accountings are done. However, something that looks like it, it is really different. So let's say if uh, the Social Security had Medicare withheld from it, and you know at the end of the year you're going to get a 1099 SSA for whatever dollar amount, it's going to be higher than the actual cash that came in to the accounting. And the reason was, is they took expenses out. They might take out Medicare, they might take out income tax, but you're not netting, you're only, in this case, you report what you actually got in the bank. And the rest of it, you can deal with later. So it, it was not given to the fiduciary, so the fiduciary doesn't have to report it at this point. Um, at the end of the year, on the 1099s, I would still report that. Um, Medicare, sometimes there's federal withholding. 
Okay, we'll move on to page 28, receipts. These are everything else that you couldn't find a form for, miscellaneous. And just list it. Um, disclosure is really important in court accounting. By that, I mean, it's not good enough to say that I paid uh, AT&T cable for the cable bill. Well, yeah, it was, you know, oh, it was for the the ward, the conservatee's house. You have to describe um, how it relates to this particular um, uh, conservator or conservatee. I call it, this general term is ward. Um, I think it comes from ward of the court. Um, so everything that didn't fit here. So at this point, we've gone through six separate page A uh, types of forms uh, on income items. And then we go back and you can use the intermediary form if you want for the total of dividends in each of the pieces and then total it out for, we're just talking about income now. And then you can go back to the GC 400, which is page 21 and enter the total on the summary sheet. And I'm not aware of any computer program that does court accounting on the government forms. Um, there are a few companies that do offer fiduciary accounting um, software. I mean, oftentimes it's done on Excel. Um, but the area of court accounting is so narrow in terms of market share, like QuickBooks works for 33 million businesses in the United States. Well, there's a real small market for software for court accounting. And uh, so a lot of them go out of business. Um, but uh, we're looking at separate forms and you go on the government court website to get um, the forms and you pull them down one at a time. And if you're going to use the government forms, that's a major nuisance. Um, I wanted to point out uh, uh, Riverside Courts has a PDF that has like 33 different forms all in one PDF. So you can just scroll right down in between the forms, kind of like we're doing here. And uh, it might be helpful if someone is going to do the court accounting on the the judicial council forms that's uh, riverside.courts.ca.gov forward slash self-help forward slash conservatorship <laughs> forward slash standard account forms pdf so i know i went too fast but if you can get to riverside superior court you can find it uh, the other nice thing about riverside is they have two classes on uh, online, one on being a conservator of the person and all the conservators duty, a free video. And they also have uh, a free video on conservator of the estate, which means court accounting. So if somebody's just a conservator, say grandma got uh, Alzheimer's and we have uh daughter now taken over as conservator if the person's only conservator of the person there is no court accounting because there's no assets under that conservatorship if they're appointed as guardian of the person and guardian of the estate then that means there's court accounting required Okay, so we're I'm way off on the pages here. Let's get back 
we don't want to go backwards. No way. Uh, I should start using bookmarks. Okay, so we were here at one point. Now, okay, receipts, uh, miscellaneous. I think maybe we covered this. Okay, so we're on page 29, and we just sold the house. Okay, this is really weird compared to tax. Okay, we had a carry value when we started from the probate referee at 230000 and we sold it for two hundred and fifty. So the way you're supposed to report it is a nineteen thousand dollar gain. Well, is that the gain? Hell no, that's not the gain. You have realtor fees, escrow, all kinds of charges. But this is the uh, fantasy that they want it reported: gross sale price, gross carry value, gain. All right, we'll do it that way. Uh, Later on in the forms, we'll cover the expenses on a house sale, but not now. We treat those separately. And when you're dealing with house sales, always get the final closing statement. When I'm doing house sales on tax returns and stuff, the people bring in a preliminary closing statement and you're not sure if it was changed radically before it um, was finalized. And, and the reason why people don't get the final ones or they know about it is the title companies only sell the quote or, or distribute the final closing statement after escrow close, deeds are recorded, and then they mail them out to the buyer or the seller. And when you're turning in your court accounting, you have to submit um, original uh, documents for the closing statements. And um, why don't I cover this new law change? Um, it just came out. And if you have a pencil, you might want to write down some of the code sections. Um, first of all, what we used to do. When you do court accounting, you got to turn in all original bank statements. Fine. And then we started getting the banks that say, go paperless. And they almost insist, uh, I won't take paperless statements. But that made a problem turning in reports to the court. So what we did do before this law changed was we would print out bank statements, um, monthly bank statements from the online source and then bring them to the bank and have them put a rubber stamp on them, which was a nuisance. Um, as of January 1, 2023, we have new uh, procedure that we can do that uh, the courts will allow you to submit electronic bank statements that were permitted, uh, I mean, that were printed. And so you go to the website for the bank, you print out the statements that you need to turn into the court. And then what you need to do is now you have to do what's called a verification. So the verification says to the court, these were electronic statements. I have not altered them, changed them, spindled, mutilated, or anything. And they're just the way they were printed from the computer. And that has to be signed, obviously, under penalty of perjury to be a verification. And that goes on top of your bank statements. So since this law is so new, I have not seen anyone uh, publish the kind of verification that would go on top of uh, the bank statements. What we normally do is take um, the caption in a court case. It says, you know, attorney or pro per, what court it is, what the case name is, what the case number is, like you would see on all court petitions. And then underneath it, put your verification that these are original unaltered bank statements. So. If you want to look up any of this new law, 
related to verification of bank statements that are electronic, you can go to the rule, California rule of court 7.575, California rule of court 7.575. And then they refer you on declaration under penalty of perjury to the code of civil procedure section 2015.5 and if that wasn't enough they also point you to probate code section 2620 subletter c so if you want some entertainment you can look in there and come up with a a new uh, verification cover sheet and if you do make one could you send one to me please because I'm going to need one. Um, another form that's frequently omitted in court accounting, and, and uh, I don't have it in the material, um, it's form GC400 capital F. And what this does, it's a change in form of assets. So this is important to the court. Let's say you transferred assets from Bank of America and put it into Wells Fargo. Well, that has to show here. It's a change in form or um, another change in form of asset would be, let's say a stock split. You own, uh, I don't know, Google stock and it splits into alphabet soup. And uh, so now you just don't have one type of stock anymore. That would go on the uh, Schedule F. Um, when you're in your court accounting, and, and we started out with the beginning inventory and appraisal, you have this asset list. Use numbering for all your assets, both cash assets and non-cash assets. And as you're going through accounting through the years, don't change those asset numbers keep them the same if you ultimately we sold the house in here already we sold the house and let's say that was asset number nine fine it disappears off your beginning and ending inventory balances and just leave number nine out so you'd look at your asset list you go asset number eight and then ten um and the Probate examiners request that because they're trying to cross-reference uh, what assets we have and what happened to us. I have a couple questions. Okay, I have a couple answers. When you said the change, um, uh, change in type of asset moving from one bank to the other, yeah. doesn't that show up as a, you know, we close this account and we open this account? You can do that. Um, generally, you'll see transfers from one to the other. Um, and I think on the change in form of assets, um, it was on your inventory and appraisal. Uh, that's a good question because the, the next question is, what happened to it? Where's that account three, four, five? Um, right. Right. Uh, change in form of asset. I, I'm trying to think, and I don't have a, a super good answer. Um, my first thought, uh, speculating, is on page 29, the uh, gain on sale of assets. It's nothing, so you'd, you'd put, uh, uh, it's not really a sale, but you closed it account two three four hmm uh, yeah that doesn't sound right because it's it's not going to be a gain or loss and they're separate gain or loss I would um put it as a separate line item on the change in form of asset put you know transferred from in this case mission federal into first citizen and then on the line that said it came from First federal account closed and the data was closed. Okay. And 
since you know it is not going to carry forward, I think on my beginning inventory and appraisal for that asset number, you would have a balance at the beginning of period. I would mm -hmm. add that the account was closed on May 25th and transferred mm -hmm. to First Citizens Bank. So it's on your inventory and appraisal. They look at it and they want to see where it is at the end and it's gone. Where they're looking to begin with, it says it's gone. So don't cry about it. We closed it. I don't know if that makes sense. Makes sense to me, but what what other did that answer it? Yeah, yeah. And then you were just talking there was another question I had that you were just talking about something else. And I'll let I'll let you read. I'll let you go back again because I can't. No, no, what I want your question. Come on, come on, give me a question. No, but I can't remember what you were talking about that oh. spurred the question. Okay. <laughs> so you forgot. Well, we'll just we'll forget about that. You'll think of it. It'll come to you soon. So another thing about these court forms, because um, I just checked the um, the statutes on it, and uh, a lot of people, you know, have there's no resistance to the GC four hundred sum because you don't have a choice. But on these forms that we're looking at, like this one, we're on disbursements. Um, if you if you're doing a fairly small accounting, you can do them on judicial counsel forms. Um, if you're doing a big accounting, you're not going to be doing them on judicial counsel forms. I guarantee it. Um, but what the statute says is that you can use spreadsheets like for this schedule, but it has to include the essential information that's on this judicial counsel form. So as long as you're close and kind of follow that, you're okay with converting to non-judicial counsel forms. Okay, so now we're in disbursements, conservatives at nursing home or something. It's more like 6,000 a month instead of 3,000. It's very expensive. We have one client that had 150,000 of um, housing and medical <laughs> housing, uh, nursing care. Okay, so we're back in disbursements, continuing on, and this one is general and administrative. I translate that to miscellaneous, but uh, we're managing the estate or the trust. So we have, uh, says, uh, the conservators getting money, but they're only getting reimbursed and attorneys getting some money, but they're only getting reimbursed for the uh, probates, guardianship and conservatorship. The attorney and the um, fiduciary can only get any payment at all for services after approval from the judge. And uh, it's a very strict rule. Uh, other things uh, related to court accounting, one is a, a tax issue. Uh, the guardianship or a conservator trustee has to make sure tax returns are done. Um, there is an IRS form 56. It's called Notice of Fiduciary Relationship. It's a simple form and you put it in with a tax return. It tells the IRS, say, hey, you know, uh, Grandma Nilly is uh, has a conservatorship. I'm the conservatee. I'm responsible for all the tax. And then another form that may be helpful would be the power of attorney form, uh, IRS form twenty eight forty eight, IRS form twenty eight forty eight. And with that one, sometimes. If somebody's incapacitated, we have to file um, a power of attorney form so we can deal with IRS. And maybe we don't even know what the income and disbursements were. And in that case, we will prepare and file an IRS form 4506 
T is in transcript, 4506T. And what we do with that, especially with multi-year non-filers, you ask the IRS to give you a computer dump of all the income and expenses they're showing from 1099s, 1098s, and W-2s. And uh, it's very helpful because you know exactly what the IRS has on their computer. Can I ask about another IRS form that okay. I haven't been able to ask? I've had people reference it, but I can't get a straight answer when to use it and when not to. IRS Form 56. Notice concerning fiduciary relationship. Yes. Um, I can't get a straight answer from CPAs or fiduciaries or attorneys when we should use this form and when we shouldn't. Any idea? Yeah, definitely. If the fiduciary is going to sign the tax return, so I'm going to be signing the tax return as the conservator for Grandma Nelly. And it, you sign the return, Grandma Nelly by Rex Crandell, conservator. Okay. Now you're showing you have a fiduciary relationship. So since okay. you signed it, you should put in the form 56. Okay. That makes sense. That's that's clear. Yeah. Thank so you. So you're, you're telling IRS, hey, you know, uh, last year, Grandma Nelly was sharp as a tack. And then she had a stroke and now she's got a conservatorship and you want to deal with somebody deal with me. Good. That helps. Thanks. Good. Where'd my cursor go? There it is. Okay. Disbursements, just general living expenses. Just list them. The one I like is the party people. Ah, yeah, live in the Vita Loco. All right. Um, on any expenses, you need to explain to the probate examiners, because they look at everything before the judge sees it. Uh, how does this benefit the ward? Uh, so in this case, it said it was for the conservatives' birthday party. Sounds legitimate to me. Uh, most of the time, you do not have to turn in receipts for the court accounting. They don't ask for the receipts. They do ask for all bank statements and broker statements. Um, you just have to keep the receipts. Um, sometimes the courts have the right to audit uh, the court accounting. And uh, then you might have to demonstrate um, you know particular transactions or something so i kind of make a collection of uh, things i went and talked to some probate examiners and asked them what are some of the things that you don't like in uh, getting accounting and one of them was not explaining how the expense benefited the ward okay so Let's say there's an expense for putting in a hot tub. Well, fine. How, why? Uh, okay, the person had certain uh, muscle problems and they had to soak in hot water all the time. Or you bought 20 sets of bed sheets. Well, that doesn't make sense. Why 20? It's only one person. And then you would put on there, it's for incontinent supplies. How does it benefit? the word I'm looking at um, other things one thing when the probate examiners I, I get all their um, when I can get them their um, what they don't like because you don't want to do that uh, one that they came out with was they don't want color paper between bank statements when you turn it into the clerk and they don't want things stapled um, uh, the other thing is when you turn in your court accounting, um, let's say it's a probate or whatever kind of case, um, they have a thing called examiner notes or tentative rulings. So if you have a court date on August 1st, 
you should be looking at the court's website for examiner notes at least a couple weeks before your hearing because the probate examiners act like school teachers and they grade your paper and they issue something called a tentative ruling of all the things that they don't think you did right. And you want to fix them before your hearing. You get the forms that they say you need or whatever, because if you don't fix the items on the tentative rulings, you're going to have your case uh, continued, which might mean another six or nine months before you can talk to the court. Uh, so just keep in mind, they call them examiner notes and they call them tentative rulings. And you have to poke around your court's website to find out where those are, probably under something to do with the probate uh, department. And those are separate from probate notes? No, they're the same. Okay, thank you. Yeah, they just happen to call. The reason why it's tentative ruling is most judges, when they have the probate examiners look at stuff, if they say something's wrong, the judge gets it, nobody fixed it, the judge is going to say this is all wrong. And and just tell the person um, in court what they do is oftentimes they'll have the bailiff uh People come in and say, I didn't know what was wrong with the, my reports. And so they have the bailiff give them the transcript for the um, tentative ruling so that next time the uh, pro per person can get it fixed. Uh, other common errors in accountings are accounting for assets that you have no responsibility for. You know, it's a brother, aunt, uncle's property. You're not putting it into your accounting. Um, another thing is in accounting, you don't account for real property outside of California, which sounds unusual. Um, it's frequent that um, confusing accountings, fiduciary accounting with other types of accounting. And this one could be a problem. Let's say you're a trustee and you hire an accountant and they say, yeah, I know everything under the sun about court accounting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they don't. So you, they do the work. It's all wrong. They don't, I went to, I'm a CPA. I went to accounting school. They don't teach court accounting at all zero. And so just because somebody's a CPA does not mean they know diddly about court accounting. And the problem is if the trustee or, or guardian uh, conservator pays for accounting that's wrong, then the trustee or, or conservator can ha be, have to reimburse the estate for the wrong accounting until it gets done right. Uh, a quick question. Yeah, when, you talk, when you talked about um, the out of state, and I know in a, in a case we're working on, under conservatorship, it was easy enough to ignore the property in Arizona. Once she died, we now have probate in Southern California and an ancillary probate in Arizona. And we're doing some work on that property to even for as is. Um, so so we're going to need to on that. I know that ultimately in the end, the money from that sale will will roll over into this probate. But if there's expenses that are paid, those should probably be tracked separately from expenses that are being um, used under the California probate, right? I'm kind of hesitant to use the word right. Um, <laughs> so um, it's all inclusive. Uh, what it sounds like to me is with the two probates going, um, you have expenses for both and you have court accounting for two jurisdictions. So if the California probate is paying things for the Arizona, you might show them as a uh, a liability that the air like a loan from money that came out of California, and then clear it later. Um, it sounds like additional disclosure. Um, I don't know how to handle it, um, but they are separate accountings. And hmm. 
Ellen, Helen, have you ever had an ancillary probate, out of state probate? I heard you. No, thank you. Isn't that nice? <laughs> no. But they keep trying to knock on my door. No, even when I work for an attorney, I have a, a probate that's being done in Canada. And we're and I think because it's personal property, we don't need ancillary. So wait a minute. Yes, I do. Yes, we are. We are actually going through an ancillary in Canada in another case, but I don't have to do it because we have a professional fiduciary that's working through it. And she's an attorney also, so she took the reign on taking care of opening all of that in uh, Canada. So I've never had to do ancillary. Okay. It's yeah, a and they, very I, word. The, well, the, only, the other ancillary I did that was really easy, there was an out-of-state trust and they had, the, they had the pocketbook. So I only had to sell the property. I didn't have to worry about the pocketbook. But at minimum, since we're in process right now, I'm thinking that we should be really careful about tracking when money is spent, if it's spent for that ancillary probate. So I can I talk to you. What, what I'm hearing is, you know, we have these separate schedules for income and disbursements. And maybe a separate schedule with an explanation of the disbursements that went out to the um, Arizona probate. Okay. Another thing you can do, and uh, you can go to the court, and they usually have office hours, like 10 to 11 or something, and you can talk to the probate examiners, and they can't give legal advice, but if you came up with a conclusion, they can comment on whether it's proper format. Just don't phrase it like legal advice. Say, here's right. a schedule I did. Does this look like what you would accept? Um, and they're very helpful. Okay. And you can also, if it's your first accounting, you can bring your entire accounting and ask them, does the format look correct? Don't look at any of the numbers. You know, dear examiner, does it look like I'm in the ballpark on my formatting? And they will answer that. Yeah. So, that's uh, another resource. Oh, I got another resource. All right. The Fiduciary Accounting Handbook. Wow. It's only 350 bucks from CEB, Continuing Education of the Bar. It's uh, written by Margaret Hand. She's an attorney over in Arinda. I've taken several classes for, from her. And it is a reference book to look up things. So that's another resource. Uh, I know our law library here in Contra Costa has it, but don't buy the book thinking you're gonna learn how to do court accounting with that book, it never happened. Like you're not gonna learn about everything from an encyclopedia either. Yeah, but, I, I saw that book and I was wondering if it was worth the money. If you need to look up something like what happens when you have an Arizona and California probate going at the same time, I think that book might be a good place to go. There is no other authority on the subject that I'm aware of other than just doing pure uh, legal research. And and I would, I would uh, sometimes with the probate examiners, we can fax our question in and get an answer easier than uh, standing in line out there in the courtroom. Uh, okay, so these are the next page we're on is 34 and I got to get moving because Tamara's going to get on my case here if I don't, if I don't give her enough time. Uh, so we have house sale expenses listed from the escrow and, and it's funny about escrow statements the only number that you never use in a court accounting is the amount of cash that came out of the escrow to the estate. Because <laughs> you deal with every other number and the end result is the cash that came out on the escrow, but it's not posted anywhere. Uh, okay, so we've got, we're on page 35. We have furniture sales. This happened to be a consignment 
of furniture that was sold by a third party, uh, disbursements for a rental property. Um, I am a tax person, so I like Schedule E of IRS Form 1040, uh, and they don't like it. Um, they want every little transaction shown. Okay, we'll have to do it that way. Disbursements, other expense. So we're in the miscellaneous on the outgo this time. And what do we have here? We sold the jalopy, uh, the old Oldsmobile. We carried it at 3,100. We sold it for 3,000. We ended up with a loss. So it says here, inventory and page appraisal item seven. So they're identifying the asset number on the inventory and appraisal. So the examiners know where that, that card disappeared. And now we're at the cash at the end of the account period, reconciled balances. And then uh, non-cash. And this is the one where you would be putting in um, the estimated market value. Um, on We've had a discussion here in the office about diamond rings and stuff. I can't tell a diamond from a zirconian. So I would be uh, hesitant to uh, use the word diamond if I don't really know. Uh, but it must have been appraised to get a carry value. So you can use the appraiser. Oh, by the way, you know, when you get weird things that you need to uh, have praised and value, the probate referees have to appraise everything. Uh, by law. And online, there's a probate referee handbook. It's about 80 to 100 pages. And it tells a probate referee everything they're supposed to do. And I've looked into it. If you have some weird asset, like a coin collection or stamp, whatever, it tells the probate referee what they're supposed to do. And it can be helpful for you. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go back to the GC 400 sum when I can find it. It was on page 21, I believe. Wrong. 23. So what we did is we went through all the detail for these subschedules. And then we have total assets available. And then we went through all the disbursements, what went out, we accumulated the cash, non-cash, and da, 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 we balance. The other thing that I suggest is I'm a old term accounting uh, person and I like adding machine tapes. It's hard to find an adding machine anymore. But my point being, even if you're doing electronic addition, subtraction, check your numbers every time because if you're missing a few, you know, doesn't balance, oh my gosh, it takes forever to um, get to an answer. Uh, let me do two things. One is uh, if you would like a completion certificate that's so awesome, we can even put your name on it. <laughs> you can uh, send us an email, we'll get that to you. Uh, is any are there any questions on the GC four hundred sum before I leave that? Hearing I, none, go I, ahead. I would just add that I even in probate accounting I use this and I also use the I I get no money from them but the essential forms that's now owned by CEB it yeah. does an excellent job of helping to reconcile this form. And you're absolutely right with reference to balancing, uh, but the Judicial Council form through the CEB essential forms, it actually does the calculation for you on the form. But remember, that's a, an investment, you know, like a six or seven hundred dollar investment. Right. And we have and pro wouldn't do that. 
Yeah, we also have um, the essential forms. Used to be Martin Dean's. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's very handy. You got all the forms there if you want to fill them in. It, it's uh, it's useful, and it'll put in your headings and your case numbers and things. Uh, it's handy, but I I had not I did not know that it it will do the math. Oh yeah, but, oh definitely, and it actually you if you start there on each of the accounting, it will help you figure out where you are, and it, it's a wonderful tool. It is, and but all of the forms are in the file tree separately. Correct. Yeah, so you pick through what schedule you're looking for. Okay, so this is, uh, to me, a work of art. Um, this is an accounting on Excel, and I just want to show you, because we've been working on the uh, the judicial council forms, this is the equivalent of the GE 400 sum. We have property in the beginning, receipts, gains, total. You would take this summary sheet and transcribe it onto the judicial form GC 400 sum. Now, this is a property at the beginning of the account. I would list asset numbers. Now we go through, uh, this is a different way of doing it, but it's the receipts during the period and it's chronological. And I need to give this microphone back to Tamara because she's getting impatient. So uh, we do chronological and then we do by categories for income and disbursements. We have income and by categories. Uh, it's in your material. Uh, you can marvel at it. Um, but I need to find Tamara's place here before I exit stage left. <laughs> Let's see. Sample report. Okay, so I yeah, think it's the first uh, account current and reported conservator. That's yeah, and it's one. on page 11 in our material. So I'm going to give it back to Tamara. Y'all were just having way too much fun in here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Porter County is exciting. All right. Okay. Are we ready to try and end? Again, I see six new messages on here that I'm not sure um, Rex saw or used. So sorry about the, it's difficult with both of us talking to re also read messages at the same time. But anyway, so the last part of the class, now that you've gone through all the fun accounting part, sorry, hold on one second, Rex. Never mind. Sorry, I just wanted to close the office door because I'm somewhat loud when I talk. Anyway, um, will be what do you do with the accounting once you have it done if you're a pro per and or how do you get the accounting looked at, reviewed or whatever um, once it's done? So um, we explain or part of the class is that um, first of all, you start on pleading paper you have your data up top. Um, this is the court. In our case, we've had a conservatorship, so we indicate the name of the conservatee. In our example, this is the first account. So really what you're doing is asking for um, it to be settled um, approving some of the things you've done. And this is the only time for asking, unless you've done it through a different petition, for um, fees for the conservator and or the attorney. So um, I just... <laughs> 
I just had this happen with one of my um, newer attorneys that I'm working for now. Um, so it is a conservatorship and um, the conservator said, hey, is there a way because the amount of money I have fronted on my own for the conservative while we're getting all this approved and blah, blah, blah is quite excessive and um i said really like excessive like a couple thousand and she's like no like fifty thousand dollars and i was like wait what you friended fifty thousand dollars like who can do that um but it was over i guess quite a long time before she completed the uh, um, conservatorship papers blah 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 but also it came to find out that she's paid the um, conservator now um, has paid the attorney quite a handsome amount of funds. And um, thankfully it was not from the conservatee's money. So he got off a little bit on that part. But um, so I said, I wrote him and I said, uh, you realize you're not allowed to collect any fees. You're not allowed to do all these things until you get a court approval. And he's like, oh my God, okay, do I return that? It was, so we went on and on. So just make sure that you're really diligent. And I know um, that fiduciaries know this. You are not allowed to collect any fees as the conservatee, the attorney, I'm sorry, conservatee, conservator, the attorney, or anything else in those two realms without getting court approval. So now we have our hearing date. As you see, it's over one year from the date of the order. We have the time who the judicial officer, typically I myself do not put the judicial officer's name, especially um, recently I'm seeing quite a few shifts. So every time it's seeming like um, if, you, if your hearing to get approved was in 2012, by the time May 2000. 13 comes around, this judge is not even in the probate department anymore. Um, it's happening a lot in Alameda, not Contra Costa so much, but down um, south somewhat. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of changes where judges are switching and going into different apartments and like half the time where I thought I had a judge who knew everything. Now I've got a brand new judge. So I kind of like to leave this blank. Um, although when it gets down to a lot of times the order part, um, I will put the judges in because usually I'm doing the order off the minute order or something else. I used to do the orders ahead of time, turn them in. One, I'll tell you, L.A. County will not let you file an order of any kind until the actual hearing. And not only that, where I may have asked for full authority on the petition and maybe they only give limited or I ask for the minimum $20,000 bond and they issue a $200,000 bond. Um, that all comes off the minute order. And so LA likes you to wait till you get the minute order before you complete the order. So then I'll include the judge's name because I know who heard the case. Anyway, so you start writing the petition. Again, this is going to assume there is an attorney. He works for the petitioner who is the conservator, um, conservator of the state of Jeannie, who is the conservatee. So you're presenting your first account. One of the first things you want to indicate is your appointment. You do not want to, and this is another reason why I tell you, because you're going to see it in this example. You don't want the judge to have to go look and see if you're counting the right time period and blah, 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 because you're just going to tell them all that, him or her, sorry. 
So petitioner was appointed on March 8th. And I'm going to quickly show you that's the same day that we indicate on our inventory and appraisal. Sorry, got to slide down. And then letters were issued on March 14th. So again, you see why we used the date the order was done and not the date of letters. So at all times since this appointment, he's been acting as the conservator. So he wasn't um, suspended, anything like that. Number two, indicate the inventory and appraisal. So when it was filed and what was the total value? The period of the account, again, it covers March 8th, which is the day of the order. And goes almost a solid year, or they consider that a solid year. So remember, especially with conservatorships, um, and if the first accounting is due one year for any after that is every two years. The charges and credits, which refer to your accounting. Remember, I don't see it on his screen up here. Charges and credits, those words come off of the sum, charges, credits. So that's what you're indicating. Sorry, I'm going to switch. Um, so are from this time period. Charges and credits should be approved. They're shown. Number five, investment accounts. Remember, at all times, they should be invested or maintained in an interest-bearing account. Remember this interest-bearing account. I will tell you um, a few things, but I've said this in many of the classes. There was a time we had a case where somebody was a conservator and had money in a bank account, did not check to see if it was interest-bearing or not. Um, spent so much time taking care of the conservative. She really didn't pay attention, didn't bother, didn't mind. Um, she was the conservative for a uh, conservator. I'm not sure if it was a year or a longer time period. One of the children who were the heir was an heir or going to be an heir once the conservative passed away, um, sued the conservator for um, interest because that person did not put the money in an interest-bearing account. So sued her for the interest she would have received if the person had it in an interest-bearing account and the conservator was charged and did have to pay that amount. So make sure you're in an interest-bearing account and for several other reasons also. So then I had one of my new attorneys again, not one that's done uh, this for a while. So he comes to me and he calls me up. In fact, this was recently about a week ago and he's like, Tamara. And I go, yeah. And he goes, so the house sale, because it's, you know, a over a million dollars. He goes, so the house sale um, or... So what I, can we tell the court, because I think they were getting limited authority, didn't want to do the house sale as a court confirmation. So they wanted full authority so that they could just sell the house outright. He says, what if I put all the funds in my state bar trust IOLTA account? Does anybody want to attempt to answer what my response would be or why and why? Uh, please don't. Correct. Please don't. Please set up an estate account. 
correct? Please don't commingle any funds, please. That's one. That's one. Do not commingle, but there's a couple other things. Anybody else? Come on, anybody else? Okay, so let me just put take you off the hook. Yes, proper. Do not commingle. But here's the other thing. State bar, IOLTA, or uh, sorry. Uh, You're state, right. start, state bar, IOLTA, trust account. All interest for all money in that account goes to the state bar. It never, ever, ever would come out and be given to the conservative uh, T, correct. So it that is not an interest bearing account for the benefit of the conservative. So I said, that is another reason, no. And he says, but still is protected and blocked. And I said, yes, but state bar earns the interest. And you are putting yourself at liability for doing that. So you are right. No, I said, absolutely not. Don't do that. Um, they've gone through other things with, uh, should I, can I do a retainer? I don't even like the retainers with conservatorships because if you read the probate code, which is 2450, I think on fees, um, I think it's probate code 2450. Um, but it will specifically tell you that there's to be no deposit, there's not to be a reserve, there's to be no payment to an attorney unless it is um, uh, approved by the court first. And if a conservator is to pay an attorney without having an order of such, that conservator can be ordered to pay back their own funds, the uh, um, conservatee for what was spent because it wasn't approved. And not only that, I'm sure that judge is going to have many, plenty, pretty words for that attorney for going beyond. So no doing that. Anyway, and no allowing the attorney putting the money in their state bar account. So Let's go on. So in our case or in our accounting, we had a sale of an automobile. So we're telling the court up front, hey, I had, we sold the conservative's automobile. She's no longer able to drive. She doesn't have a license. She doesn't have competency. So many other things. So there's no need for a car. It was on the inventory and appraisal. Attachment to, right? Non-cash. Item number seven, although in our sample, uh, attachment two did not even have a car, so this is funny, but um, what item it was, it was sold for a loss. That loss is recorded on Schedule D of the accounting, and the conservator requests confirmation and approval by this court of that sale of depreciating property. Some ask, why? why? What does it matter? I just got rid of the car, blah, blah, blah. By doing this, and once the ju judge signs off on this, well, it would go into an order, but um, because they, they won't ever sign off a petition, but once it goes into the order, the any beneficiary, opposing party, uh, anybody else cannot come back and later take you to court because, I don't know, they felt you called it a, a depreciating asset and they called it a um, high-end luxury um, vintage automobile. Anyway, once it's approved by the court, knocks out your liability. So you have a sale of an automobile. Now, in this petition, and I've said this so many times, and people have got wrong what I'm saying, but those were propers. If you did not have a sale of an automobile, don't put sale of automobile, conservator did not sell any automobile or anything like that. Don't put the title in just because it's here in the sample. If you did not sell an automobile, automobile, sorry, tongue-tied, maybe this becomes your number seven or something like that. 
there are certain titles that will need to be in the petition regardless, like one through six. But items seven and eight are optional and only if you had this occur in your um, during that one year time period. Okay. Sale of furniture. So it, again, we'll go through the same thing. They sold the furniture in the Newport Beach home, which was, I think, the vacation home. Um, it was on the inventory and appraisal, blah, blah, blah. And just go on to explain why um, you did what you did. In this case, current servitee will never be able to return home, will never use this furniture. It's on consignment or it was sold or it was whatever. Even here they state the items um, that, sorry, items sold were not considered numerous or valuable enough for an auction. Sold for the appraised value, less a dealer's charge. In this case, they used a dealer. So just explain. Um, you may just say um, donated uh, furniture was worn tattered, you know, or... Um, I don't know, cats attacked it or it was ripped because house was broken into. I mean, it could be any of valuable things or maybe you sold it and just be honest, you sold it. Again, eight is a optional item. Okay, sliding down. Um. Uh, Oh, in this case, anytime you're selling something that belongs to the conservator, I, conservatee, sorry, I get those tongue tied. Um, you're, you're technically supposed to ask um, the conservatee or tell the conservatee and get their permission. So another new one I had come in, I think yesterday or the day before. So I had one of the attorneys ask. We filed for the sale of, again, the mobile home because it's the property. They're not happy it's sitting vacant. Um, she will never be able to return home. Bedridden, needs 24 hours, seven day a week care. Um, she has no real assets besides the mobile home, um, but doesn't pay for medical, the home care and stuff like that. So... Um, we filed a um, petition to confirm um, the conservator can enter into a listing agreement. So we're not even at the whole sales thing. And <clears throat> that was done ex parte. And it came back, which I've not seen these come back like this before, um, but it came back in the judge of the court wrote a red line across the whole top page and said, um, won't be heard ex parte is scheduled for a hearing on a short time frame, which is what we wanted. But I think it was via a stamp and not handwritten, but um, conservator must make all efforts to inform the conservatee of the sale of the home and get um, her consent. And so attorney came back to me and he goes, oh my God, what do I do? She's completely incapacitated. Um, you will even see the probate exam uh, refer investigators um, had a hard time. She wouldn't answer any of their questions. She spoke about many other things. So that tells you her capacity. And so he says, 
So does the conservator go tell or meet with a conservatee, tell her she's going to sell her house, and then just write down the gibberish that she talks? And I'm like, yeah, that, yeah, you can do it that way. Or me personally, I think I would rather maybe ask somebody at the care home who is the nurse, who is the intake, who is someone there to um, possibly do it for me and say, hey, can you do me a favor? Will you explain to the um, conservator, I, I would like to sell her house. And is she okay with that? And then have that person write a declaration um, or a few other ways, because then it looks better than the conservator saying, because basically she can go, oh yeah, I told her. She said fine, or she didn't answer, or she didn't, and there's no real proof you told her, and maybe the courts aren't looking for that, but anyway, um, that's happened. So in this case, um, you will see how they state there was consent. This is the sale of real property. Um, this is the vacation home. So... Um, here is this. It is not, let's just say the vacation home is not as strict as the primary residence. So for a conservator to sell a conservatee's primary residence, ooh, they're a lot, let's say, more restrictive in letting that go because that truly means the conservatee has no way to go back to their home and a lot of them pride their home they lived in that home for many many they have memories there and all of that um so it's much easier for a vacation home you have to do a totally different thing you would be able to sell the even if you had well, in a conservatorship, you don't get full authority or limited authority, but you could never sell the um, conservatee's home without getting court approval. And with mine that I'm doing right now, now I'm having to go through, I had to explain that the park is unhappy about it being vacant. I had to explain it's been broken into two times. I had to explain she'd never be going back there. And so um, she's on very little income and her space rent um, it still has to be paid. The, the insurance on the uh, mobile still has to be paid. The utilities which were connected to the mobile space still have to be paid, even though they're not really. So like, for instance, garbage is every four weeks. There's nobody there, but they still have to pay garbage because there is a certain law about if you have a property, it has to have garbage or something, you know, so there are so many expenses that were being paid that the conservatee would never benefit from. Um, so it, it totally different. This is the vacation home. Don't think of this as the real, the primary residence. Okay. Additional bond in this case, um, remember the bond was set at the original probably cash value because there was a sale of a vacation home. Now the monies from that vacation home turned into cash. So the conservator herself went and applied and increased her bond amount. It's very unlikely that that happens. They don't know to do that. So that's not usual that they go off on their own and um, unless they've done it before. Anyway, so you're talking about the sale of the house. Now the conservator believes that the bond amount is sufficient. Again, that's left up to the judge to decide. I'm going to go down another required and very important um, notice you must put up here is no affiliate relationships. 
during the account period, you haven't hired an agent who was a family member. So recently I had one, um, which I was kind of concerned about, but I guess I was concerned more than anybody else or the courts was, um, but this was a decedent's estate where a husband was administrator um, and wife was a realtor and not only was she the realtor who listed the property, she's the one that also found the buyer. So she was the wife of the husband who was also a beneficiary. So her mother-in-law's house, she was the sales person and the buyer's agent. So all of the money that was she received she was keeping in house and so i was worried the courts were going to look at that and go uh something shady's going on or something funny's going on or something like that they didn't even bat an eyeball and i was worried about it for nothing i was trying to explain everything out and blah 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 but i did it and i explained it and i said everything and i was quite um surprised um quite surprised by um that so again i also use the example say for instance she had a gardener she usually pays the gardener 50 dollars um uh, a week to do gardening say the gardener calls you and says i can't do the gardening for a month i'm going off to i don't know vacation in hawaii my son happens to be home for college um, need some money. So I tell him, Hey, I've got this job. I'll give you $75 every time you come. No, that cannot be done. I cannot pay my son who's off for college more money than the regular gardener just because he's off for college or he's doing me a favor or whatever. Um, be very careful about that. Um, and you must report it if you do it. Okay. I'm going to quickly try and move on because I am going to end at 1230. Conservators compensation. Um, I've had another party ask or an attorney. So the conservator spent 150 hours providing services to his mom. He visited the care facility and on and on. He's listing whatever he did. I had a conservator who asked on their um, on their petition for payment because mom, he had the conservatorship over mom. Mom lived with him and he says he has to care for her 24 seven because he has, um, she has dementia. She's, you know, tried to, um, uh, walk out so he's had to do that he has cameras going i guess some type of alarms at their door so that if she tries to walk out the door it wakes him up blah 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 and i said still you're not caring for her 24 7 you have to sleep sometime some somehow some way so you yourself are not caring for her 24 7 365 days a week anyway uh, courts don't care about that. Even if you say mom's on the sofa watching TV or just, I don't know, playing or doing something, you're really not caring for her. She's kind of caring for herself. You're not charging for the time. So just be very mindful of that. Also, there is um, local court rules you can look at depending on your county and your court. Um there is local court rules which say what the fee structure is for how much you can charge hourly. Um, and I know that, um, like for Contra Costa, and I'll just give you an example, it was their local court rule 7.450. Um, that did change in july of 2021 so many years ago i guess and now it's their local court rule 7.426 um which provides um the hourly rates so for instance even for attorneys charging fees 
Um, it, it's based on their experience. So zero to five years, it's a certain rate. Six to 10, it's a, another rate. So make sure you kind of keep up with that. Um, if an attorney, if you're doing this for an attorney and they're charging fees, but they will also, there is also fiduciary rates. For, so if I'm just going to give you a Contra Costa. So their hourly rates are between 125 and 195 per hour. Um, but the fiduciary staff, it's a different rate. Um, a non-professional fiduciary, um, say it's a pro per that's completing this on his own or wants to charge a fee, is now 75 an hour for the rates. But again, here's the other thing I say, a really a conservator cannot go in and say, I want $10,000 in fees and the conservatee barely gets social security in of 2000 a month and is barely living off of that. Um, and still with her expenses, you're not going to get those fees. So be mindful. Um, but that's totally different for a fiduciary service team, whatever on the rates. I'm talking about more propers. So then we get down to attorney compensation. Again, attorney has to, if you've ever done one of these, has to be very explicit in his um, invoice to the court. It has to say date. Um, amount of time, what services were performed, um, what benefit the conservative received from those services, blah, 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 and then um, what rate, and then a total amount. So that's on here. Now we're getting down to veterans' benefits. You're explaining whether the um, conservative is receiving benefits or not. You're also stating whether the conservatee has been a, a patient in a state hospital. Typically, those are chargebacks sometimes or not, um, but you must state that. This one, 16, I rarely see this, um, but it's the conservatee's address. I don't like this at all. It's on the example, but I've told everybody, I don't like it at all. Again, this is public record. I've already t filled out a million forms to get the conservatorship, which states where the conservatee is. I don't really want it on this petition. I, some, Especially, well, I might be a little bit more okay if she's at a convalescent home because they have some type of security. But if she's living at home and maybe you're only doing a little bit of care because she's not really that bad yet, or he's not that bad yet. I, I don't, you don't need to know that the person living at this address kind of, you know, has maybe some slower whatever. And just with today's world, I don't, I, I, I don't like that. And I don't want it out there. So I don't put that on there, but some people do. Okay, you have your account statements, again, submitted to the court, but not attached to this because it's none of their business and they mark them confidential. So it will indicate, again, this sample talks about original bank statements. It's a little bit older. It hasn't been updated. I do know now Rex went through that they will accept the um, printed off the internet type bank statements. So again, this information might be a little dated because that just was allowed recently. Capital changes, you're talking about what change happened um, in, on here. Statement of um, liabilities, whether there are any liabilities. Now, again, I don't go into as much detail, especially if I'm not a fiduciary, if I really don't know. I don't go into the note, what the interest rate, what it bears in interest, 
anything like that, um, I would just state if there is still a note um, and explain how much and how much it is monthly. Then you have special notice. Thankfully, you all should or do know about special notice. Anybody can file. I think it's $40, maybe $20, $40, I think. Um, they pay any court case to have, request special notice. I see these a lot for inheritance, advanced lenders on probate. Um, otherwise, I really don't see this a whole lot. But you have to state if anybody has requested special notice. Then we're getting down to the end where you're going to pray. What are you going to pray? You're going to pray your account is proved and settled. You're going to pray that the court approves of all acts that you did through the year. You're going to pray that the court approves you selling the automobile, even though it was a depreciating asset and it sold for a loss. You're going to have asked the court to approve and confirm the sale of the furniture. We also have, the, you know, anything that's happened during the account period. In this case, the conservator is asking to pay himself $500 for the 150 hours he spent carrying um, or doing things for the conservity. You're asking for the attorney, um, the sum the attorney wants. Again, you're saying he's rendering the services already, but has not yet been paid. And then you're asking the court to grant whatever um, relief or further items that he, he or she wishes to grant. It's dated, it's signed, and then it's signed by the um, attorney. Last thing is, and this used to be very popular item, it's slowed down quite a bit. I would get tons of calls all the time. The court clerk or the examiner um, would state, need a verified deck because this is all that would be turned in. No one could figure out what a verified deck is. Those are the exact words that were used. They couldn't give legal advice to say what a verified deck is. Um, I'm going to show you very simple. Immediately they come to me and I go, oh yeah, they haven't signed a verification. A verification is something I declare under penalty of perjury and we're gonna get to it, sorry. Verification, here we go. I'm the conservator of the person. This is the account. I believe to the best of my knowledge, blah, blah, all this information in the accounting is true and correct. I declare under penalty of perjury, it needs to be signed by the conservator and dated, and that's what the verified deck is. So I would get them all the time. I did all this work, I did my accounting, I did the petition, I did everything, and they want a verified deck, I don't know what that is, and it was a very simple thing. But always remember to have this um, attached, and that is it, I am done. Does anybody have any questions? I know I went through the petition part because we have one minute left and I wanted to end it. But does anybody have any questions, comments, stuff they like, think we should have gone it over more, um, anything like that that you want to quickly say before you all jump off? Great job. Wow. Thank you. That's thank great. You. Great. Thank Thank you. Thank you. I hope it was helpful. Again, like I said, we go through the same class. You can take it as many times as you want. We go through pretty much the same things. I will occasionally myself, um, because I experience so many different things in between the two months, will give samples of things that have happened recently to some of my accountings or stuff like that. But otherwise, the material are the same in each of the class. But I'm always also able um, to help you if anybody is going through an accounting challenging and they really just 
have spent hours and can't figure it out on their own and need to or wish to ask me to help them or help them find where they can't make it balance or something like that, um, you are free. And I don't know if Rex provides contact information anymore, but I can type it in the, see if I can type in the group chat, my, um, add an, I, I don't even know how to add. I don't know what he has this on here. I was going to say, add my email information and I don't see how to do that. Um, but so my email address is CA, C as in cat, A as in apple, the word legal, L-E-G-A-L, and then D-O-C-S dot com, uh, two, sorry, two at gmail.com. Let me do it, say that again. C-A, the word legal, D-O-C-S, the number two at gmail.com. I'd be happy to help you, like if you're just totally frustrated. Now, that doesn't mean... I just now need to start and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to help you prepare the whole thing. No, it, I meant more for you've done all you can. You can't figure out why it's not balancing or what am I missing or where should I put a house sale or where should I put something that's very odd. Um, um, you can always send me a message. I'd be happy to help you. Now I do see, um, somebody who wants to sign up for another class and they want to know, um, when that is on the Contra Costa County law library website, they will state the day of the next one. Um, and you can, they will state how you can sign up for the class if you wish to. I'm trying to, I'm now looking at um, messages and everybody's saying goodbye and they're leaving. So anybody else still on have any other questions I haven't answered um, or uh, item that you've had just a her time with that I could quickly answer? Or are y'all ready for lunch? No, everybody's quiet now. So I'm going to assume y'all are ready for lunch. I'm going to say thank you for taking the class, taking the time. Again, um, I know in your stuff, they've asked for you to give or rate the class. Let us know if there's anything you want to add, take away, talk too much, whatever. Um, you can do that. Otherwise, you can sign up for another class anytime. I thank you guys and signing off and saying goodbye. Wishing you all a great day. Thank you all.